I'm Chung An Kim from NEC Labs. Uh, this work is a uh, joint work with six other uh, awesome researchers from Purdue University and IBM. Um, this work was done when I was doing my PhD at Purdue University before joining NEC Labs. Okay, so I'll be talking about uh, uh, real-time microcontroller systems. Uh, there are many real-time uh, systems that are built based on small computers microcontrollers. Um, many of these devices are uh, safety critical. Um, just imagine that you are flying next to a drone coming over to uh, NDSS. Uh, of course, this is a, although this is a, a joke image, uh, 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 when this kind of device is uh, under attacker's uh, hand, it can uh, create a serious issue. So, uh, however, security is often overlooked as a trade-off uh, to uh, guarantee some performance constraints, mainly because uh, real-time guarantee for these systems is not just the performance uh, metrics, but also they, uh, they, uh, they depend on, uh, they provide a, a basic functionality of these systems. So among many different security features, uh, memory protection or memory isolation is uh, 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 a basic feature that most desktop or server systems deploy. However, in microcontroller-based systems, uh, process memory isolation uh, and kernel memory isolation is often not deployed. First, uh, process memory isolation uh, is not supported because the hardware typically does not support, is not equipped with a memory management unit which supports virtual memory. Uh, because of this, uh, uh, all the processes in the system share one large physical memory space. Uh, so basically, uh, for these systems, uh, you have to compile the applications in the operating system together, and they are built into one large formal image, and you basically load the image into the memory, uh, physical memory space. Uh, peripheral devices are mapped to certain ranges of the physical memory space, and they are controlled by uh, uh, memory mapped I.O. operations. Because there's no virtual memory support and everything is in the large physical memory shared, um, uh, the entire memory space can work as a, a, a large attack surface. So for example, if an attacker compromises little process, that uh, also means that he can uh, support the entire system and do anything he wants, basically. Um, this attack is uh, one attack that we crafted based on uh, existing uh, ideas of the attacks, and uh, uh, let me show you the video first. So what the attacker does basically <laughs> is that uh, when the attack is launched, uh, uh, he compromises uh, uh, one of the little process that does not control the flight, and he goes across the process boundary and modifies the uh, global data used in the control loop so that the uh, flight is affected and it, show, it shows a strange behavior like that. Um, also, importantly, kernel memory isolation is uh, typically deployed in your desktop systems. And uh, indeed, um, kernel memory isolation is supported by uh, many microcontroller hardware and major RTOS support through uh, privileged and unprivileged uh, processor modes, similar to kernel and user memory uh, separation, and also based on a lightweight version of a memory management unit called MPU. Um, this does not support uh, virtual memory, but it's more like a segmentation level access control. Uh, however, we observed that many real-time microcontrollers do not employ uh, kernel memory isolation mainly because uh, uh, the performance overhead introduced by uh, uh, kernel and user mode switching. We verified this claim uh, with 67 real-world systems. We manually looked at all the codes and found that they are not deployed in the manufactured devices. And uh, we also, to back uh, our, our claim, we uh, manually enabled kernel memory isolation in, uh, in the uh, prototype system in our drone and measure the performance overhead. And we found that uh, the deadlines, the uh, constraints of these real-time tasks were violated when we actually enabled kernel memory switch, uh, kernel memory isolation. 
So the second attack we crafted, I'll show you the video first. So basically when we launch the attack, the attacker uh, tries to cross the user and kernel space boundary and then uh, modify the hardware configuration of the uh, hardware timer that the uh, real-time scheduler uses as a clock. What, what the attack, attack does is that uh, it writes the largest frequency value in the register of the hardware so that basically the real-time OS runs based on a very, very slow clock so that uh, when we uh, actually launched the attack, we lost our control out of the drone, and the drone kept flying, elevating the, uh, 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 the attitude. Uh, so actually, we broke one of our drones because of this attack, and this is the second drone we have with the tether on. Okay. So um, the idea of our work, Minion, basically, is that uh, we break down the, the large physical memory space into uh, chunks and customize the chunks for each process and build a, a new boundary called memory views and use these uh, memory views as access control rules that can be used by the uh, hardware so that we can in enforce the views during runtime. One key idea of our architecture is that um, instead of separating the RTOS and uh, applications in the two separate modes, uh, we actually run the OS and applications in the same unprivileged mode so that the applications can access the hardware resources without actually causing expensive uh, uh, kernel user space switching. The only small uh, module that we run in the privileged mode is uh, something called view switcher. It's a tiny module that basically takes the uh, memory views as inputs and at one time, it enforces the views uh, using the uh, uh, MPU hardware. So what is memory view? Uh, technically, it's, uh, it's a set of memory regions that are required to pro uh, run a process correctly. Um, to find uh, the, the memory boundary called memory views, uh, we basically uh, have, uh, we go through uh, program analysis to find all the code data and peripheral device accesses that are essential for running uh, each process. And we do that through uh, static formula analysis in uh, LLVM bitcode. Um, and our analysis uh, is based on the tar uh, the considering the target, done considering the target attacks such as code injection and reuse, illegal data corruption and accesses, physical device abuses that go across the memory view boundaries we build. First, code reachability analysis. The goal of this code uh, level analysis is to find all reachable functions from the entry functions of each process. Um, to do that, we first uh, analyze the firmware boundary statically and build a core graph like this. And then how we find the entry functions? Uh, we, the entry functions include the start function of each process, such as the main function, and all the interrupt handlers that are used in the execution of each process. Um, we find the list of these functions by uh, uh, performing a separate set of code reachability analysis, analysis on a few RTOS functions, such as the uh, process start function, and then, uh, and then do the code reachability analysis starting from these entry functions. Um, of course, indirect codes are uh, a uh, like known uh, 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 topic that are difficult to analyze and uh, find um, we used an existing tool called uh, SVF to do interprocessual analysis, a points to analysis. And then, um, and then based on the analysis results, we build uh, executable memory regions for each process so that later uh, we can enforce, uh, we can only include these functions for this particular process at runtime in the memory views. For data accessibility analysis, there are two different types of data, global data and uh, stack heap data. For global data, uh, we run four slicing based on uh, interprocedural pointer aliasing. For example, when there's a call graph like that, um, 
global data and global, global variables and constants are accessed uh, at arbitrary locations in these functions. What we do is basically we run four slicing on each of these global data and then find all affecting instructions and then build a list of global data for, uh, for all the functions reachable from each process so that for each process we find all the global data and the, the corresponding access permissions that are essential to run the particular process. For stack and heap data, because of the dynamic nature of the stack and heap data, we uh, uh, ran a dynamic profiling to find the, the size of the uh, heap and stack memory needed for each process. And then we modified the, the memory allocator of the RDOS so that the, the, the memory pool can be deterministically allocated for uh, each process so that uh, other processes cannot access to that process's particular uh, stack and heap memory pool. For uh, device accessibility analysis, uh, this is feasible to analyze mainly because we found that only a few patterns cover most of IO operations in the firmware. So there are a, 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 a limited number of cases. And also, MMIO addresses, the addresses of the physical devices mapped are embedded in the firmware mostly as constants so that we can do analysis from the uh, constant addresses backward. For example, uh, the most simple case but most pervasive one in the firmware is that uh, so the address of a device is uh, defined as a macro and then it is directly dereferenced for store or, or load in a, in a statement like that. More complex case is that uh, uh, it can, there can be an interprocedural uh, data flow. For example, there could be a, a query function like this IRQ info function, and the other function asks the query function to return the address of a particular device, and that address is later used to store or data, uh, store or load data into it. Uh, of course, there are more complex, uh, more complex cases. Uh, those are discussed in the paper. I just don't have enough time to explain everything, so please look at the paper if you're interested. Uh, similar to uh, global data analysis, uh, we find all the loads and store instructions that, uh, uh, that use MMI addresses as, uh, as an operand. And then different from global data analysis, we do backward slicing through interprocedural value graph to find all the affecting instructions on these MMI operations. And then include these uh, uh, address ranges in the memory view of each process so that each process can only have these memory uh, mapped regions when it runs correctly. Okay, so at runtime, uh, we first load a view switcher, tiny model view switcher when the device boots up that's the first module that runs. And then that one, uh, the view switcher takes the, the results of the analysis as input, of course. And next, the view switcher loads the RTOS in the memory in the unprivileged mode. When it does that, uh, it configures the MPU hardware so that none of the programs in the unprivileged mode can access the view switcher running in the privileged mode. And, the, and when the RTOS runs, uh, creates the processes like P1 and P2, and the RTOS schedules P1 into the schedule queue, uh, we basically catch that uh, interrupt process switching event. And then that's the time we reconfigure the MPU with the uh, corresponding view, uh, memory view for P1 so that when the P1 runs, it can only have the memory view that we customize so that it cannot go or make any accesses across the process boundary. Similar to P1, when P2 is scheduled in, we again reconfigure the MPU configuration to uh, enforce the memory, particular memory view, view for P2. So our, uh, our prototype is built uh, based on a commodity 
popular uh, drone called 3D Iris, Iris Plus. Along the way of implementation, we found new, four new vulnerabilities in the firmware. We reported this and they, the developers could fix the vulnerabilities with our help. Actually, three of these uh, new vulnerabilities were found by just enforcing uh, the, the memory isolation into it. When we just enabled it, uh, we could just catch the vulnerabilities because actually the memory, they're, they're, these bugs were some, uh, silent memory corruptions that the, the programmers could not find because the memory isolation was disabled. Basically, no segmentation port. Uh, with uh, uh, memory space reduction, we could, uh, uh, with Minion, we could save, uh, we could reduce the 76 percent. We could, uh, uh, in every, we could uh, reduce the memory space to 76 percent. Um, and we also, uh, along with the two attacks we showed, we built uh, eight realistic attack cases. And then with Minion, we could detect all of these without violating the real-time constraints. Um, this is a, another video uh, that basically protects, that detects the attacks and lands the uh, drone safely, but I guess we have to just skip it without, we don't have enough time. Uh, the performance impact, we show that uh, uh, none of the real-time tasks, for, the no, no, for none of the real-time tasks, the constraints are not violated with our protection. So I showed that uh, uh, Minion could provide the memory, bring memory protection as much as possible into these microcontroller systems. It reduced the significant memory space, maintaining RT responsive needs. Thanks a lot. Uh, you can uh, access the uh, source code. Will be, it will be posted there pretty soon. So, yep, thank you very much. So uh, Trent Jager, Penn State, uh, nice talk, I enjoyed it. So uh, on the system side of things, it, it looked like you essentially implemented a microkernel for RTOS systems. So the, did, the that, did you yeah. look at other microkernels and see whether they had the mechanisms? So that you needed? Uh, yeah, so, so the main difference between microkernel and this, mm -hmm. is you, you can probably view this as a, a Kind of software MMU. So the only thing that it, the only like the hardware interrupt that it handles is mm -hmm. this context switching. Whereas microkernels have to handle every interrupt and every, you know, like system call request. Whereas this one only handles, only has to interrupt the mm -hmm. system scheduling in and just reconfigure the MPU to enforce. Yeah, that's okay. the main difference I would say. Okay. So, I mean, yeah, the microkernels will receive the interrupts, but they'll usually just pass it up to the Yeah, I mean, the but OS, you have... But, but yeah. you're only intercepting the one exactly. type of interrupt. Okay. Exactly. And, and then it also knows about processes, and does it know about communication between processes, the, the, view, con the view controller? Yeah, so, so yes. Uh, in our prototype, there was no... Uh, uh, communication between processes, okay. but it's totally possible that process can communicate. Yeah, so yeah, it is true that this our work doesn't provide the strongest notion of memory isolation. It's mm -hmm. true, but uh, I want to claim that uh, it brings memory isolation as much as possible without violating these constraints. And mm -hmm. previously, the entire memory space was open in this system. So, yeah. Okay. Thanks. No problem. Uh, Matt Noonan from Gramatech. Uh, it was very interesting. Thank you. Um, I was at, I had a question about the LLVM IR. Um, were you lifting from the firmware image to LLVM, or were you compiling the source code of the we firmware? We, we compiled the yeah, source okay. code. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. 